Yeah, I think um, for Monday, we probably should do a follow-up with this video mm -hmm. uh, just to wrap this up. And uh, maybe um, see what John, well, the next one isn't till June. So we, we don't have to do anything around the, uh, uh, anything. We'll just do wrap up about this and uh, Rich's talk. And, you know, if you could capture a couple of key points um, to put in, and we have a lot of material too, but I think we'll do is just like bulleted points. Mm -hmm. I see we have some people coming in right now. Okay. So, Elliot Soloway. <laughs> <laughs> good morning, Rich. There he is. <laughs> so good, morning, good to Rob. see you, Elliot. <laughs> yeah, nice to see you guys. <laughs> good to see you. Rich, Absolutely. can you take your screen down for a minute? You bet. Let's see. Oh, it went up to the top. There. Elliot, I'm glad to see you uh, still the same old. You haven't been damaged by the, this uh, virus. <laughs> nah, nah. I mean, you stayed uh, healthy? Yes, knock on wood. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, that's that's the key yeah. piece. You and your family yep. been all right? Yep. Yep. Good. I have more students, though, seniors, out with COVID the last couple of weeks than the entire, than ever before. Really? They're, they're falling like flies. Every wow. day I get an email, two emails. They're sick. Can't come to class. Okay. Yeah. It's weird. Yeah, it's really now, weird. Yeah, it's really weird. Rich, I find something interesting about how this long COVID is looking like the uh, uh, other, you know, autoimmune diseases. They're starting to pay more attention now to uh, autoimmune and, uh, you know, getting it out of that, oh, it's in your head kind of thing. So mm -hmm. it's good to see. It's one outcome. Hey, Kathy. I had a delightful breakfast or coffee the other morning, Stephanie. One of your mentees. Hey, Kathy. Yes. So I'm going to acknowledge uh, Kathy and Rich. We did this about, what, 20 years ago, something like that? Pretty close to it. Yeah. And you're yeah, the only one that still has the same amount of hair, Kathy. So oh. that's good. None of us ah, have but we're going a bit more gray. <laughs> Here comes a lot of folks. Good morning, Jan. Hi, Rob. Jan Costa's back in town, so that's uh, that's uh, Jan. Your and your practice is open, is that right? You might as well make a little pitch here for J yeah, Jan's yeah. a psychotherapist, psychologist. So, uh, Jan, yeah. people want to reach you. What, how do they do that? Um, Jan Costa with a K sixty five at gmail dot com. All right. Well, and I will uh, be putting out all these uh, different. Uh, connection so people can do that connection. Lee, good morning. Lee Benjamin, you out there? No, I don't see you. Good morning. Yeah, there you are, Lee. Stuck on good morning. Lee, how's, how's things in the emergency room? He's emergency at Trinity Health. Uh, what's going on? You, you see an uptick or? Uh, seen a little, little bit of an uptick, but uh, we're, we have adapted and it's just routine these days. Okay. Unfortunately. Yeah, unfortunately. Hey, Paul, how are things for you out in uh, the western part of the state? Good, good. It was a nice day yesterday. I got a 20-mile bike ride in, so it was great. Nice, nice. How many people, is this their first time uh, on board here? I see a few new faces. Uh, Megan, you want to say hi? What, Megan, you want to put your mic on and introduce yourself? Yes, hello. I'm Megan Hudson. I'm the Director of Performance Excellence over at Trinity Health Muskegon and the Trinity Health Medical Group. So you, you use uh, Lee Benjamin as your poster child in for... <laughs> no, I need you. Head. I need you. Come, come yeah. over. And we're excited to, um, you know, bring joy into process improvement. So very Excellent. excited to be here. Excellent. Well, I know you, if you worked with uh, the, the folks at Mercy uh, at Trinity, Rich? Um, just about to start. Just oh, good. To Excellent. Start. Yeah, we have our first meeting coming up. That's right. Excellent. We've actually had a few contacts over the years so yeah. with the wider uh, Trinity Health System. Yeah. And Commander uh, Fritz, how are you? Doing great. The term is wrapping up. Just got a little grading to do, and then it'll be into summer. So 
Have you seen an uptick in the uh, students out? Elliot said he did, so uh, I don't know. Oh, it is. Uh, it's a. Uh, it's the most disturbing thing I've seen in twenty years. Um, the last couple of years, and uh, it's not just me because I was just in a meeting with other faculty, and they all talked about it. And then the lead article in the Journal of Higher or a Chronicle of Higher Ed, same thing. Record levels of disengagement. You know, I teach a I teach a two hundred eighty person lecture, and for me, I was complaining because I was like oh, I have like 30 or 40 students that just don't show up out of 280. And all they all looked at me and they said, you, you only have that many missing? Like we have 200 missing out of 250. <laughs> and, wow. and I, so it is, uh, it's really extraordinary. Uh, I think it's a combination of just accumulative fatigue from, from all of the, um, you know, the COVID, the restrictions, but there's something else going on because they are just... I mean, these are some of this is Michigan, right? I mean, I mean, I'm not trying to put on airs, but this isn't like a put on community college in the middle of Iowa. This is University of Michigan, right? I mean, these people have clawed their whole lives to get here. And they're just like, oh, I just can't do that assignment. <laughs> what do you mean? Oh, I can't come to class. What do you mean? So yeah, it's really, uh, it's a challenge. It's really shocking. Oh, that's too bad. I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, yeah. I'm going to get started. I mean, I think we've, it's, it's amazing that we're still talking about this crisis two years into it. Nobody would have ever thought about that. Uh, I know Elliot, uh, Rich, uh, Elliot, are you out there? Yeah, there's Elliot. Yep. Elliot, can you comment to what you just said when you started that you're at the School yep. of Engineering? Yep. And I've never seen uh, as much stress, worry, concern, and illness. There, even the early COVID, I've seen more kids out now than ever before. And they're all completely stressed out. They know about the war. They know about what's going on. And they're, they're just it's sixes and sevens, right? They really are distressed. I've never seen it. I agree, Eric. I've just never seen anything like it. It's very upsetting because, you know, the young people... Right. And they just completely out of it. Yep. Well, that's really discouraging. And I know and as it, a psychologist, I, my uptick of uh, therapy uh, demand is out of sight. I mean, it, actually, actually, the uh, therapy group, you can't find anybody that has an opening at this point. I mean, uh, everybody is really booked up. I know Jan Costa just moved into town and Jan, you're probably filling up immediately, but uh, it's just been uh, unprecedented demand for, uh, for services. And, and that's just the people that are willing to engage in therapy or able to engage in therapy. So who would have guessed that two years ago when we started uh, Leaders Connect online, that this would still be going on and that we would be having this conversation. Uh, I'm not gonna talk too long. I'm Rob Pasek, for those of you who have not met me before. Uh, I am the uh, leader, uh, founder of Leaders Connect, and I wanted to just acknowledge that this is a, we had a Michigan Leaders Read program about 20 years ago when the uh, Leaders Connect was still at the IT zone. And um, at that time, Kathy McDonald uh, and Rich Sheridan and I cooked this thing up at, at a, over a coffee, I think, at the uh, little coffee shop there as part of the food co-op. And uh, we had, well, I think we covered uh, Good to Great as the first book, and mm -hmm. uh, we had quite a good turnout. And so I'm delighted now uh, that Rich Sheridan uh, has written uh, two books uh, so that we could include these. I've written since then about seven books. Um, and uh, I think that I, I was saying to Kathy McDonald that the only thing different is that she's the only one that still has the same amount of hair on her head. So uh, that, that's, uh, that, that's a big change. Uh, but, you know, uh, Kathy, you want to say a little bit about the start of this just before you have a chance to, to roll on? What, do, what are your memories? Well, my memories are, uh, it was a group just like today uh, who came together and the idea was to talk about good business books, books that could be helpful, both in your daily life as well as in business and to have a really informal exchange, both about the book, but also with what you were trying to do in business and to make those connections that um, will go beyond the, the meeting about the book per se. So at any rate, I haven't written any books, but I can say I've inspired a few over the years. So you have been inspired many. <laughs> Kathy, Kathy is an inveterate supporter of writing. She has, if you go into her office, uh, which I used to share with her on, on uh, Ann Street, that uh, she has a 
basket full of journals, empty journals, and people could pick their own to uh, have an opportunity to, to start writing. So uh, she has encouraged Rich and I in our writing, has uh, done a lot of editing, and uh, someday she's going to write her memoir and tell all, but uh, it's, it's not yet then, Kathy, right? There's still more to, more to do before you start telling, right? Uh, true, but I do, for those of you who still like hardbound books, uh, I'm in the process of sort of purging my library. So oh. Rich, if you need more for the Menlo Library or if anyone else wants to just come and graze one day, you're welcome to do it. It's one of those little storefront offices on Ann Street near Main Street. So just drop me a line or just drop in. And it's a, it's a very uh, excellent uh, coverage of the greatest books uh, in book in not just right business but anything relating to business uh, for example in June we're going to have our next book uh, which is from John Bacon now John Bacon is not a business writer he is uh, generally known for sports but he's going to this his new book is on leadership and it's about his experience coaching uh, the Huron hockey team from uh, the dregs to success so uh I think everybody's going to enjoy listening to John in June. And in May, we have a real treat. Uh, May 17th, Thomas Zerbuchen, who many of you know, was a teacher. Uh, he was uh, many of our co colleague, uh, colleague of us at the schools uh, at University of Michigan, is now the head of research for NASA. And he's going to be presenting some of the first uh, pictures from the satellite that he helped launch. And these are dealing deep into the cosmos uh, and really they're trying to explore the origins of the universe. Now I know a few of us are that old. Paul, you might remember the, the beginning of the universe and I can certainly from my 75 years, but he'll be going even further than that. So uh, hopefully uh, all of you could join and get those pictures. I, I'm afraid we're still gonna have to be online because I don't trust uh, getting back together again in a large group. So I think at least until next fall, uh, these are going to continue to be online. So I'm going to turn this over to Rich. Uh, and Rich, uh, I'm delighted to introduce you. You are somebody who has gained a great deal of fame. I, I certainly uh, remember your first source of fame when you were on the cover, I think it was at Forbes. Yeah. And yes. uh, that was that was pretty amazing because it was early in his career uh, as, a, as an entrepreneur. And I know people like Elliot and uh, you know a few of others are still trying to get on the cover of even the Observer, but we haven't made it anywhere. So, oh, the Observer would be amazing. I, yeah, I that, well, we, we'll, get it, we'll get it. We'll get a portrait of your, uh, uh, right. of you and you and a few of your associates there. So, Rich, you want to kick it off and talk about uh, your new book? Well, it's not that new at this point, but the newest book. Absolutely. Well, great to be here, and uh, let me let me. This is a neat full circle moment for me uh, because, um, you know, a lot of people look at what I've written about and, uh, and quite frankly, let's, let's face it, the word joy in the context of work, typically those two don't fit together, do they? Um, and unless you're Elliot Soloway, then there is always joy. Uh, <laughs> and um, and I appreciate having people like Elliot in my life who are just such a positive life force that it re-energizes me every time I get together with him. But um, my journey, you know, a lot of a lot of people ask me where the joy came from and and how do they get it in their own lives, and then I have to tell them a story of kind of twenty years of utter pain in my career, and at the midpoint of that painful part of my career. Uh, I was actually contemplating getting out of the software industry entirely because I was in so much pain. There was so much chaos. There was bureaucracy trying to tamp down the chaos, but that didn't work. So you'd squirt around the bureaucracy to stay in the chaos. And, um, and I, was pretty, I was pretty despondent at that point, midpoint in my career. And I was contemplating getting out entirely and uh, was thinking about starting a canoe camp in the boundary waters of Minnesota. That's how far away from technology I want to get. And anybody who uh, knows my wife and my daughters, like Kathy does, uh, would laugh and say, yeah, they, they weren't going to the boundary waters with you, Rich. And um, uh, so I decided in that moment, I had to find a way out. 
my inner optimist kicked in. I was stuck in a room full of manure. I knew there had to be a pony in this room somewhere. And so my journey out led me to authors and books. And that began in Kathy McDonald's office. My wife, Carol, worked for Kathy at the time. I'd come in and visit. I'd sit down with Kathy. She'd ask me how things are going, just the way Kathy always does. And I'd start describing all this pain. And she'd reach back on her bookshelf and say, here, you should read this. You should read this. You should read this. And um, you know, the books I remember that have had great influence on me uh, were books like Peter Drucker's books on management, Tom Peters' book, In Search of Excellence, uh, Peter Sengi's book, The Fifth Discipline on the Art and Practice of Building a Learning Organization. All of these books were telling me there was a better way of doing things than was customary, uh, but they didn't tell you how to get there. They just kind of gave you a picture of, here's some companies that did some really wonderful things. So that journey was uh, left as an exercise to the reader, I suppose. But, um, you know, I just want to publicly declare that uh, uh, Kathy McDonald was huge in saving me from that trough of disillusionment period. She gave me the, the beginning steps for what would ultimately lead to what we created at Menlo Innovation. So Kathy, I just want to specifically call you out and say thank you for all that. Um, you were a huge influence in my life at a very important time in my life. And so what we're going to do is uh, I'm just going to share my screen here and make sure I do this reasonably properly. Uh, it's always fun to get technology to cooperate. Um, so I've written two books, as Rob said, I'm not as prolific as Rob, or, or I don't have as much time as he does to write. I don't know how he'd write seven books in the same period of time I wrote two. But um, uh, the two books are Joy Inc., How We Built a Workplace People Love, and Chief Joy Officer, How Great Leaders Elevate Human Energy and Eliminate Fear. And um, the second book is focused on the more ethereal things inside of Menlo, the more invisible parts of leadership. And I was, quite frankly, very reluctant to write a book on a topic as big as leadership. Because I can assure you, we are not done. I am not done. And uh, fortunately, I have a great editor at Penguin, and they encouraged me. He said, Rich, nobody wants to believe you're done with leadership. That's not the kind of book this should be. They want to hear the journey rather than hear about a destination. And so uh, the book is really broken into two big pieces. What are joyful leaders? What are their values? And leadership values usually layer on top of core values of a company. And how do you build a culture of joyful leadership? And so the chapters in the first part of the book are exploring different values uh, of joyful leadership values like authenticity and humility and love. Uh, that felt like a risky chapter and everybody tells me right who's written read the book tells me that's their favorite chapter. I thought I was going way out on a limb on that one. Uh, optimism, visionary leadership, uh, talk a lot about the influences Zingerman's has had on me in terms of their uh, ability to teach us how to envision the future, um, but yet being grounded in reality and servant leadership. And then in the second part, talking about um, how do we do this? How do we build a culture of joyful leadership? And one of the gifts I've been given since, um, uh, since I wrote the book and started talking about it was a very simple model for thinking about a company that is pursuing joy uh, within their organization. And I liken it to uh, the forces at work on an airplane. Um, you know, well, even if you don't have a pilot's license like I do, um, we all have a basic understanding of what gets an airplane up in the air. And the way I uh, draw the analogy to human organizations, there's a lift of human energy that has to overcome the weight of bureaucracy and a thrust of purpose that has to overcome a drag of fear. And so the second part of the book explores that in, in, uh, in great detail. And so uh, today, we're only going to look at the first part of the book. I suppose my publisher is hoping that um, uh, by doing this, you will be intrigued enough to buy not only a copy for yourself, but 10 copies to give away at the next major holiday period. Uh, <laughs> but um, 
Uh, in the first part, you know, I, I explore this journey of mine that I alluded to when, when I was stopping at a Kathy's office, uh, somewhat depressed about my own career. And um, as I have reflected more deeply uh, since, uh, since those days in Kathy's office, I realized that um, I had a dream. It was actually as, as a student, you know, and I can, I can very much relate uh, to the depression, even that Rob and, or that Elliot and Eric are referring to, because I felt a bit of that as a student. I was getting scared as I was getting closer and closer to graduation because I had already worked in the industry. I already had these hints of the chaos and bureaucracy that existed in the software industry. And I was beginning to wonder, am I actually cut out for this business? I remember telling my wife at the time that, uh, uh, not, I, I remember telling at that time, my wife, she's still my wife, Carol, <laughs> um, that uh, I wasn't sure. And she was very concerned about this. Uh, you know, we were all placing a lot of eggs in this software basket. And fortunately, it's all worked out. But um, uh, then I, I realized I had a dream. And it occurred, I can remember exactly where I was when I imagined it so perfectly. I was on State Street, right near Nichols Arcade. And I remember thinking, what kind of company, what kind of organization, what kind of team do I want to have as I enter my career? And I imagined this wide open space filled with human energy, with camaraderie and teamwork, accomplishing big things, working together on hard technical things, getting through that hard work and delighting in what we've created. I kind of tucked that dream in the back of my mind, probably like most of us do. And I didn't really think about it much after that. I launched into a career. We started a family, bought a house that we had to do a lot of work on. And life just gets busy, doesn't it? And that dream just sat like an unopened box in the back of my mind. Till one day, about six years into Menlo, I walked in. And almost like a little jack-in-the-box popping out of this box in the back of my mind, saying, congratulations, you accomplished the dream of the 20-year-old. Menlo had become that thing that I had dreamed about as a student at the University of Michigan. And it scared me when I saw that because I thought, I hadn't been thinking about this since I was 20, and now here I am in my 40s. Who on earth has been steering me towards this goal? And so... I want to encourage you as we send you later into breakout rooms to talk about this. Can you conjure up your own version of what did you dream about when you were young and what changed? What did you trade away? Because that's what happens in a lot of lives. We start trading things away for what we believe are more important things. And, um, I am now in a very blessed place in my life for the last 22 years. Menlo turned, turns 21 next, next uh, this coming June. And uh, for two years, the last two years of Interface Systems and now the 21 years of Menlo, 23 years, I have personally gotten back to that vision I had as a 20-year-old. And I know that's unusual. And I know I'm blessed to have gotten to that place. I just want to encourage you to realize you can too if you haven't gotten there yet in your own life. And um, so again, I took an entrepreneurial journey to get there. It doesn't even mean you have to start your own company. A lot of my encouragement to people as they start pursuing this kind of path is you can do this inside of your own organization. I did it as a VP of R&D at Interface Systems, a tired old public company on the west side of Ann Arbor. Uh, I tell that backstory in the, in the introduction. Then I start walking through in the chapter on what are the values of joyful leaders um, and talk about the authenticity that uh, we all strive for in our own lives. And um, I, I, there's a very moving story that actually brought me to tears when writing it. And I know a lot of people who read the book are, are also brought to tears by it. Uh, we entertain a lot of nonprofits here at Menlo, and by entertain, I mean we bring them in to teach our team 
how, uh, how their nonprofit works, what their purpose is, and so on. And one of the ones we brought in was Ellie's Place. And I'm just going to read a section of chapter one to you, uh, because uh, it'll probably help me get through it without tears. Um, so there is a wonderful nonprofit in Michigan called Ellie's Place. It was named for a baby girl, Ellie Stover, who died at 11 months old and left behind a grieving family, including four siblings, who had great difficulty processing the painful loss of their youngest sister. At Menlo, we often hold lunch and learns, bringing different leaders in from the community and engaging with them over a brown bag lunch. The leadership team of Ellie's Place came in for one of those. They walked us through their program, explaining the activities they offer family members, particularly children, to connect with others who have suffered a similar loss. One of the exercises they do with their group members is to create laminated placemats with drawings of their loved one's favorite meals so they can still share dinner time with their lost sibling or parent. It was so touching to hear how this helped kids navigate their grief, and we were all moved by what was written on each of these thoughtful creations. Reading <laughs> reading, I Miss You, Dad, tore me up inside as I thought of my own daughters. The more poignant artifacts the Ellie's Place team brought were hard plastic masks similar to those to where you wear at a costume party. Each mask was personalized by the young grieving family members. On the outside of the mask, the kids, typically teens, figuring out how to express their confusing swirl of feelings, would write the emotions they hoped the rest of the world would see. Things like, I'm doing okay, I'm better now, I'm fine, I've moved on, or even just happy, fun, or other positive emotions. On the inside of mass, they wrote what they truly felt, those emotions they didn't feel comfortable sharing with the public. Those words were very different. When will the pain go away? Why, God? Lonely, scared, hurting, abandoned, bitter, lost, guilty, or angry. As the Ellie's team explained to us, the teens shared the inside of their mask with each other. Of course, many of the same words and phrases show up on everyone's inside mask. For the first time since their loss, these teens realized that others shared their feelings, which allowed them to open up in new ways and begin to authentically process their broken hearts. And I think for leaders, this is the hardest part, is how much of our inside mask are we willing to share with each other, with our teams? their spouses, with our families? And can we in fact be the same person at work that we are at home? And if we're not, if we're living a lie at work, most of the waking hours, self-medication may be the only way to get through those days. Eric and Elliot, I grieve for your students as they struggle with what they're going through right now as they see this confusing swirl of emotions about what's been going on in their lives and in the world and what can they do about it. Uh, we've all faced elements of that in our lives. Um, we, have to, uh, we have to work through them. And I know the only way to do that is with each other. So I hope in the breakout rooms, you can talk about some of these questions as well. Why are we afraid to share our true selves at work? What do we wish our colleagues knew about us? What happens when you are your own worst critic? Um, and so, uh, and one of the things we talk about in this book is a great exercise that comes out of the Center for Positive Organizations, one of the most wonderful business, organ business school organizations probably ever invented. And uh, they have an exercise that they teach you how to do there called the Reflective Best Self Exercise. And I would encourage you to both read the book about how we use it here and then consider introducing that exercise into your own organization. It's a great one. Um, chapter two, and this will be the last part we discussed before we send you off to breakout rooms is humility. Um, you know, I love the, uh, the epitaph of, of this uh, particular chapter. It says, uh, build me a son, O Lord, who will be strong enough to know when he is weak and brave enough to face himself when he is afraid and one who will be proud and unbending and honest defeat and humble and gentle in victory. General Douglas MacArthur. 
Um, boy, <laughs> could the world use that kind of attitude right now? Um, and so humility and leadership, humility and the dog-eat-dog -dog world of the business world don't seem to coincide very well. I think a lot of, for a lot of people, humble feels like it means being a doormat. Just let people walk all over you. But being humble really means considering others. And uh, I suppose, uh, you know, one of the things I, I entertain throughout the book is this idea of the difference between hierarchical authority, bosses, and leaders. I'm not saying bosses are bad and leaders are good because we've all had great and bad examples of both of them. Um, but leadership is harder if you don't have the title and the authority because you have to lead through influence. And so what I want you to consider in the breakout sessions around these questions is, have you seen humble leaders in your organization? Again, they don't have to be bosses. They don't have to be CEOs. They could occur anywhere. But think about what the people you've worked with over the years that have been humble leaders. And uh, what is the opposite of being humble? Because sometimes thinking of the opposite of this allows us to consider what does it really mean to be humble? Um, where have you seen a lack of humility being challenging in your organizations? Uh, and what are some of the simple phrases you have seen that exemplify humility in leaders? For example, I don't know, I'm sorry. What do you think? Uh, you know, I've had to learn over the years that sometimes, uh, you know, I'm, I think all of us got into top leadership positions because we learned how to drown out the voices of others and be seen as the smartest person in the room. And um, uh, there's a great uh, idiom out there uh, that we've all heard, bite your tongue. I've actually found that's really a useful thing to think about when I'm in a meeting and I literally hold my tongue between my teeth because, and I don't chomp down hard. <laughs> But I give it enough pressure to remind myself that, yeah, keep that tongue quiet. Keep your ears going. Um, and, uh, and again, uh, finally, uh, based on the discussion we've had today, what could you take back to your organization tomorrow? This is a big topic. But most big topics, if you're actually going to implement something, if you're actually going to make changes, are going to start with very small steps. And so uh, I would encourage you to think of what are some small steps you could take today uh, to um, uh, bring back to your organization. And uh, I'll, I'll end with this. And this is uh, uh, a part of what I talk about in my keynotes that I give around the world now on these subjects. Uh, a lot of people look at me and they say, oh, Rich, you're the entrepreneur. You're the CEO. Of course, you can pursue this. And I get it. There is absolutely a place for top people in organizations to be those visionary leaders that can carry us forward. You know, a, a president can call the nation to the moon and safely back. And there are absolutely places, important places for top leaders in organizations. But the story I want to leave you with is a very different story. It's the story of Mike at the McDonald's in the Detroit Metro Airport. I've got a weakness, a quarter pounder with cheese, a large fry, and a Coca-Cola. Only at that McDonald's, by the way. I typically never go to McDonald's outside of a Detroit Metro airport, but I'm a busy traveler. I've spent a lot of time in the airport. I'm finally getting back to the airport again now. And every time I was in that airport, there was this guy named Mike. How did I know that? Because his McDonald's badge says Mike, and he's an older guy. And every time I was in that restaurant, I'd watch Mike and he'd be hustling around all these tables, clearing off crumbs, picking up the wrappers that we all carelessly left behind. But every time Mike got near me, he leaned in and he said, how's it going? Have a safe flight. Can I get you anything? Can I get you a napkin? Every single time. And I thought to myself, every time I saw Mike, I said, wow, they are so lucky to have a guy like Mike. Where does he get this energy? How does he bring that every day to a place like McDonald's inside of a place like Detroit Metro Airport? And then one day, Mike was off shift. I was there having my favorite meal. And this young kid was pulling a sled full of garbage out of the back of the restaurant. And as he got near my table, he leaned in and he said, how's it going? 
have a safe flight. Can I get you anything? Can I get you a napkin? And I'm like, I thought to myself, what on earth is going on inside this McDonald's? I mean, this is one of the most relationless places on the planet, inside of one of the most relationless places on the planet in an international airport. And these guys are doling out kindness and napkins. So I went up to Derek, the manager, and I thanked him. And he thanked me for noticing. He says, Rich, anything we can do to increase our competitiveness with Plum Market across the way, we're going to try. And here's the beautiful thing. And this is why I want to leave you with this thought in terms of what can you carry home tomorrow or today, later today. I'm pretty sure Derek didn't go to McDonald's corporate and say, hey, guys, can you form a committee to write a policy on doling out kindness and napkins? No, he just did it. And here's the beautiful thing. It was free. I never even asked for a napkin. So while there is a place for top visionary leaders, my encouragement to each and every one of you is you can start exactly where you are. Take action over, take a meeting, go run the experiment, try something today, and it has to start here. It has to start inside of you. So that's my send off for you as you go off into your breakout sessions. We're going to put you in the rooms of three to four people to talk about what uh, uh, what you've heard this morning, what feelings it conjured up inside of you, and what perhaps actions are you can take to work later today. And Richard, thank you for the hand clap. Good to see you again. Post anything that you have on chat and we'll share those uh, later. So Rich, are you back? I'm back. I'm here, right, Rob. Man, go ahead. Yeah, well, we had a great discussion inside of uh, inside of our breakout room, and uh, I think we probably could all agree it could have gone on for hours. So, um, uh, so I think uh, perhaps uh, that is a lesson for all of us at this point to consider that these are important topics we should be talking about. We should be talking about them with each other. Uh, and so I would just encourage you to continue the conversation. Uh, and again, thinking back, Rob, to what we created way back when with Michigan Leaders Read, um, our purpose was, yes, indeed, to read a book and share it with other leaders. I think our deeper purpose was to connect leaders to one another, because as we all know, leadership can often be a very lonely journey. Uh, you're often isolated from others. You're expected to know or have all the answers. And of course, we don't. And um, uh, by connecting us with other leaders who have similar challenges, and we start expressing those challenges so uh, authentically and honestly and learning from others, just like those masks when the kids turn them around and they found out, wait a minute, I thought you were, you know, I thought you were the chief joy officer. You, you know, why do you have those words inside of your mask? Um, and we all have them. And so um, I would just uh, uh, encourage you to continue the conversation. If, you know, if my books can help lead to uh, deeper conversations, awesome. Uh, but I always encourage readers to uh, grab the books that grab you. Uh, read the first few pages. If they pull you in, great, stick with it. If they don't, probably not the right book at the right time for you to move on. Um, but uh, I would definitely say, um, you know, and, and I know our, our good friend in the community, Ari Weinswag, would say it so well that readers are leaders and leaders are readers. And uh, uh, this is, these are our teachers these days. And, you know, you are, I can also say, you guys are in for a huge treat next session. If you've never heard John Bacon speak, uh, and uh, you will be in for a treat because he's a terrific storyteller. Um, and uh, I could listen to him just for days on end. And the book itself is a terrific leadership book. Uh, and, um, you know, I think that's what John talks about in that book is what we all aspire to as leaders. How can we take the ragtag team and turn them into a top performing team? Same people, maybe just a different leadership style. 
And uh, so I think you'll, uh, you'll be in for a great treat. And at this point, I'm happy to just entertain discussion if you want, or look at uh, look at the chat. <laughs> yeah, we can we can look at the chat, Rich, and uh, maybe ask some of the questions. So, uh, uh, so Lee, um, you talk about uh, TED Talk, and then let's see, Brenda, you asked uh, you talk about the lift of human energy. Um, yes. So, Brenda, you want to comment on that? I'm gonna. Can you unmute Brenda and ask your question to Rich? Sure, Rich, I heard you talking when you started today about that lift of human energy that's required to overcome the bureaucracy and then the fear. What, how, what's like, I hear that story about it's free, just a napkin and a smile. Like we just start. Yeah, you know, uh, one of the most, well, let, let's, Let's break it down into a few pieces here because you're asking uh, you're asking about five great questions inside of your single question. So I'll I'll break it down into some pieces. Uh, number one, uh, lift of human energy. There are many things we can do uh, personally, and I will say you know uh, just hang out with Elliot Soloway uh, for like five minutes, and you will learn to bring a positive energy into any environment you get in. Uh, and um, if, if you look in the Wikipedia definition of whirling dervish, uh, that, is, uh, that is our friend <laughs> Elliot's pictures right there in Wikipedia. Um, but, you know, it, is, it does start with us. You know, what, what energy do we bring into a workplace? Are we shuffling our feet in every day? Or are we meeting people with a hearty good morning and hello? Can I get you anything? Uh, how are you doing? How was your day last night? What what did you do? You know, just expressing interest in other human beings rather than the perfunctory good morning. You know, just bring that energy to work with you. Now, in terms of you know systems that are in place to keep human energy high, I will say one of the biggest things we do here at Menlo is to give people a chance to come to work and actually get meaningful things done at work. There is probably no greater sense of uh, joy and energy inside of an organization than to be able to go, to go to work and get meaningful things actually done. And you, know, you think about the typical work environment that believes we, we can multitask, we cannot, you know, human beings cannot multitask, or as my wife would say, male human beings cannot multitask. <laughs> and, um, uh, but, you know, here at Menlo, we have a very certain system that allows people to focus all of their attention on just one thing. You know, it's like that Billy Crystal line in City Slickers, <laughs> not Billy Crystal, but Jack Balance, right? It's like, just one thing. <laughs> Billy Chris like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell me it's just one thing. Uh, and if we can do that, uh, we will give our people a chance. Because what do we want to, you know, I, I remember in my trough of disillusionment days when I'd come home tired after very long days, often my uh, cold dinner in the microwave waiting for me. Uh, and Carol would look at me and she'd say, honey, you look really tired. Did you get a lot done today? And in that moment, I realized, no, I got nothing done today. I was busy from one end of the day to the other, running from phone call to phone call, meeting to meeting, uh, putting out fires and everything, but absolutely nothing done. And that will destroy the human energy of an organization. Clarity, get, making clarity a higher priority on the list over ambiguity. You know, but too often we live in an ambiguous, multitasking, just keep busy kind of environment. You know, I actually think the business school should rewrite it to the busyness school. Um, and so, uh, you know, again, these aren't easy changes, but I would, I would definitely tell you that that's one way to do it. Now, there is this other part that is the countervailing force, that weight of bureaucracy, what I call meeting load. You know, there's usually layers of organizations where there's a certain layer, that layer and above are literally human sacrifices to meetings. They're running from Zoom call to Zoom call to Zoom call, barely time to go to the bathroom in between. And I have a very simple three-step process, if you want to know it, uh, to suck the human energy out of your organization. Number one, have lots of meetings. Number two, do not make any decisions in those meetings. 
And number three, if perchance by mistake you happen to make a decision, that's okay. Just don't act on it. And you will pull all of the life out of your organization. <laughs> and so uh, finally, in your spirit of just do it, yeah. So look, let's say today in this session, each and every one of you, some new spark of an idea happens. Maybe a conversation with your in your breakout room. Maybe some thought you had as you woke up this morning and it was reinforced by something you heard today. And you're just charged up and you're like, you know what, today's the day. And you go into work after this session and you grab somebody who, who hasn't thought what you thought, hasn't heard what you've heard, hasn't seen what you've seen. And you pull them up, be like, I have this great new idea. And they look at you. Sorry, I'm losing my voice here. And they say the words that kill every idea ever. That won't work here. We tried that 10 years ago. It didn't work then, won't work now. That's against policy. We'd have to form a committee to write a new policy. And you know, sure as shooting, that idea dies right then and there. You can't fight that force. As soon as you hear that, you're like, yep, whatever. And then you move on because you got meetings to go to, you got emails to answer, you got the busy of the day that just kicks off and you never think about it again. I want to encourage you with one simple response when that happens. And I've watched this change major corporations. Look them in the eye and say, I get it. But why don't we try it before we defeat it? Let's run the experiment. There have been many famous experiments here at Menlo that have changed dramatically our way of working, our thought process, our mindset. But let's not talk about Menlo because mo many of you will look, and here's, here's my biggest point. I'm not going to let any of you off the hook today. Because you can look at me and say, oh, you're the author, you have crazy ideas, you're the CEO, you're the entrepreneur, you can go do this stuff. Let me tell you a story about Amy Ferrero, the VP of claims at Mass Mutual Corporation, a 180-year-old, $30 billion a year life insurance company. I challenge any of you to tell me you've got more bureaucracy or more baked in uh behaviors than a 180 year old life insurance company at $30 billion a year in sales. Even the, well, I guess the University of Michigan is older than 180 years. Okay. I get it. Maybe. All right. But you're on the same, you're on nearly the same wavelength as, as something as old as the university. I once asked a crowd, I said, how many of you work for a company that's older than 180 years? And this one guy raises his hand and I said, where do you work? He goes, U.S. Postal Service. I'm like, okay, Ben Franklin. Yeah, yeah. That's sure. That's old, older than 180 years. But Amy heard what I just told you in a talk I gave to Mass Mutual Corporation. She invited me back six months later to show me what had happened inside the organization when she took that to heart. She said, Rich, we're going to go look back at claims. We process $3 billion a year in claims. We're going to go into this 100,000 square foot facility of half height cubicles, all the people processing the claims of a big life insurance company. And he said, she said, when we go back there, you're going to see helium balloons taped to people's desks. And I said, oh, awesome. What are you celebrating? She goes, nope. Every desk where there is a helium balloon taped to the desk is a declaration by the person at that desk, I'm running an experiment, come talk to me about it. Now, I never said anything to Amy about helium balloons. I never even suggested this kind of idea. This was her idea. It was a cool one. She just went out and bought a helium tank, bought a bunch of Myler balloons, brought them in. And every time somebody ran an experiment, they taped the balloon to the desk. We, I turned the corner and there were balloons as far as the eye could see. It was stunning. So I run up to Susan's desk. I said, Susan, tell me about your experiment. She puffs up and she says, well, I'm, in, I'm the last stop before the beneficiary check gets cut. I've got to do three steps, A, B, and C. The trouble is if I find an error at step C, I have to go back and redo step B, and that's the longest part of the process. I decided I'm going to change the order. I'm going to do A and then C and then B. That's my experiment. Now, it didn't sound too big or too complicated, and she's just beaming with energy. I said, Susan, how long have you worked here? She goes, 19 years. And I said, have you always been like this? And her face turned into a scowl. She said, no, I hated my job. I hated coming to work. I was counting the days to retirement. I couldn't wait to get out of here. 
I said, what's different now? She says, now we can run experiments. I said, what was it like before? She says, well, every idea I ever had, I had to go up five levels, over, down five levels, back again. She says, every idea I ever had died on the vine. She said, after a while, you stop bringing ideas to work. After a while, you realize I can get my joy elsewhere. After a while, I said, it's just a job. It's just a paycheck. I'll count the days to retirement. I'll get my joy elsewhere. She said, now I love my job. I can't wait to get to work. I don't even think about retirement anymore. And I'm looking across this room and there are balloons as far as the eye could see. One simple encouragement from leadership, run the darn experiment. Rich, uh, thank you so much. I've got a, another, I think a very interesting question. A lot of people ask, uh, Molly, Leonard, are you still here? I'm unmute. still here. Hey, Molly. Yeah, can you, can hey. you ask your question, Molly? Yeah. So, Rich, the question is, how do you make time to reflect on the business and create energy within you when the business is demanding daily? Great question. Well, you know, I, I would suggest as, as, you know, as the upper echelon of leaders, the question always becomes, how much are you taking on personally that could be done by others? And how much of that stuff you give away that you feel is your own domain can actually encourage the growth in other people around you. And, um, you know, just as many people would say, if you want to see where your priorities are, look at your checkbook and look at your calendar. You know, a lot of people ask me, where, where does a busy CEO find time to write a book? Now, we should probably actually be asking Rob this question because he's written a lot more books than I have. But I never worked nights and I never worked weekends in writing the book. I did it all in the context of being a CEO. And it was very simple how I did it. I figured it would take me about 400 hours in the course of a year to write a book. I went to my executive assistant, Anna, at the time. And I said, hey, Anna, I need 400 hours. I wasn't going to say I need eight hours a week or I need to write about a day a week. I said, no, create four, okay, 100 four-hour chunks in my calendar <laughs> very explicitly sprinkle them from here to a year from now. And every time something had to be scheduled over because of course reality clicks in and you know something comes up and it, I said, don't delete the calendar injury, move it forward. I delivered the manuscript on time without overtime. I did it simply by managing my own time. So I would suggest uh, in one of the greatest sources of information on this particular topic, as many of you probably know, Randy Pausch, who delivered the last lecture at Carnegie Mellon. And uh, of course, that's usually a theoretical exercise, but it wasn't for, for Randy because he was dying of pancreatic cancer. Turns out he actually did one more lecture after that on time management. And he asked an intriguing question at the beginning of the, of the uh, presentation. He said, how many of you have more than 100 emails in your inbox? Big groan, everybody, of course, raises their hand. He says, you should never have more than 10. And like, everybody's like, what are you talking about? How is that even possible? And then he said, I'm going to talk to you today about time management. He says, I got about three months left. He says, if you're not going to listen to a guy dying of pancreatic cancer on the subject of time management, I don't know who you're going to listen to. It is probably one of the best talks on time management you will ever hear. <clears throat> Is that on YouTube, Rich? It is. Yep. Just look at Randy Pausch time management and you will, it will, it changed my life. When I got here into this meeting, I had about nine in, now I'll have a hundred, but I'm going to get out because I haven't been paying attention. I have about nine messages in my inbox and believe me, I get a lot of messages. So I, I wanted to, uh, well, we should probably wrap up. Uh, I just wanted to acknowledge one of the things you're saying about the, the most important thing, Rich, and that is uh, we've talked about COVID and over the last couple of years, uh, we've lost some friends. We've lost some very important uh, people in our lives, students. And uh, I think that, you know, the one thing I've taken away, like that one thing from Jack Palance is this is it. I mean, you, you don't have the time to say, well, I'll get to that later. I mean, every moment you have. And I think the a really an important question is, what are you doing at this moment? Are you scrolling through the internet? Could you be hanging out with your granddaughters who are in the next room? Uh, all those kinds of things are important. 
And I, I want to acknowledge one person, uh, Jan Costa's on the line here, and her husband, uh, John, passed away a couple months ago. And John was one of those people, I don't know how many of you have had the pleasure of knowing John, but he was engaged in every minute. Uh, and he made life very, very meaningful for himself and for all those around him. Uh, he passed suddenly uh, at, he was luckily the age of 77, which means he was, had much, many more years than most of you, although not many more years, uh, you know, than many of us are thinking about. But I think John lived every moment. Uh, you mentioned uh, Randy Pausch. Uh, that book was written by Jeff. Zaslow, Jeff died in a car accident at about 50 years old. So I think we can't horse around or fart around or whatever you want to talk about it and think about, well, I'll get to this later. I mean, right, every moment we have is, is a crucial moment and making good decisions about how we use the, our time, whether it's reading a book, listening to Rich, watching of YouTube, uh, watching the river roll by as Roger Rail is doing on his backyard. Uh, it's important to be thinking about that. Uh, people talk about being mindful. Well, being mindful is just kind of being aware of what you're doing in the moment and making good choices about that. And uh, Rich, you've done a great job of that. Uh, you've created a wonderful institution. I'm, I'm thrilled that it's been able to go on. And uh, I look forward to your next book because not only have you brought joy to work, but I know you brought joy to your family and you're a very dedicated family man. Uh, your three daughters are wonderful. How many grandchildren do you have now? Four. Four, wow, that's a big change since 20 years ago. True. <laughs> and uh, I, I think I know Rich's daughters and Kathy, you know them since they grew up, right? Yeah, so uh, they, she knew them as little children because they, they all live in, we all live in the same neighborhood, so. Uh, I just want to encourage you all to, uh, to live in the moment, uh, enjoy your moments, and uh, Rich, appreciate it. Maybe you can come back in the fall and get to chapter two, because we're just getting a uh, taste of this right now. Awesome. Thank you all. So Rich, I'll get, let you close. Any, any parting uh, thoughts you have to the group? <clears throat> well, I'm going to just say uh, the things we've talked about this morning aren't easy, and I get that. We're all busy. What they are is important. And I think that's probably uh, the lesson you will learn from Randy Pausch is uh, the call of the urgent is always there for all of us. And there are important, urgent things we should be working on. But typically what we do wrong in our time management process is we go from urgent, important to urgent, unimportant. And what Randy will teach you, and this is a Stephen Covey lesson, is move from urgent, important to non-urgent important, because the opposite is procrastination. And I think a lot of you know that there are important things that are calling you, and if you leave them go for too long, they will become urgent important. And your job is to make sure they don't. Rich, I have a question for you as we wrap it up. Appreciate that. And Covey's another one to read and reread because he's got some amazing things to say. But uh, we've left some chat uh, questions out there. I wonder if you would be, how, could people either uh, email you those questions? Absolutely. Or yes. Yeah, please. R. Sheridan, just like it's spelled up there on my Zoom window, at MenloInnovations.com. And I will be happy to uh, get to them. And, and likewise, if any people want to put chats on or, or comments to, uh, to, I will be uh, writing uh, my Dr. Rob uh, newsletter on Monday about this presentation. So if any of you have thoughts you want to share, please email me with those. Thank you very much, Rich. Appreciate it. Let's all give Rich a big hand. Hey, and uh, have a great day. Enjoy the moments. <laughs>